Hello, and welcome to the Just Campus, Restorative and Transformative Justice Practices for Jesuit Higher Education Today. I'm Jim McCartan of Fordham University's Theology Faculty. I'm the chair of the National Seminar on Jesuit Higher Education, which publishes the magazine, Conversations on Jesuit Higher Education, the sponsor of today's webinar. In a moment, I'll introduce our moderator, after which we'll hear from four panelists. But now I want to invite audience members to share your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. You can submit questions at any time, and later in the program, our moderator will give panelists a chance to respond. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderator, T. Shea Duncan-Smith, the Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Santa Clara University, a position she, uh, she assumed in 2021. Previously, Shea served as Assistant Vice President and Dean of Inclusive Excellence and Community Development at Swarthmore College, and before that in various leadership roles at the University of Michigan. Shea has also taught courses on leading during racial crisis, accountability, and incentivization for advancing equity at the University of California Race and Equity Center. With gratitude to you, Shea, I hand things over and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Jim. The Jesuit mission is a mission of reconciliation, working so that women and men can be reconciled with God, with themselves and with each other and with God's creation. In society and on our campuses today, we have to contend with being within our own social media echo chambers, coming out of our Zoom rooms, back into the classroom and a variety of different social settings. And for many, learning how to connect with humans all over again. Add that to the current social political issues going on around the globe and the challenges on our campuses. And it brings us to the question, questions actually, of how we can come together despite our differences. How can we come together to heal past trauma? How can we come together to repair, reconnect, reconcile and transform our campus communities into just campuses. I am thrilled to have the opportunity to moderate today's panel on the Just Campus and look forward to hearing from Marcus Mesher from Xavier University, David Cart from the University of San Diego, Heather Kimball from Georgetown University, and Yahuru Williams from University of St. Thomas as they discuss the value of restorative and transformative justice practices and their experiences with implementing these practices in their daily work. So before we get, begin, let me tell you a little bit about our, our, our panelists. Marcus Mesher is an associate professor of Christian ethics at Xavier University and a graduate of three Jesuit institutions, Marquette High School, Marquette University, and Boston College. His research ranges across questions of human dignity and rights, social, environmental, and sexual ethics, and healing social divisions. He is the author of The Ethics of Encounter, Christian Neighbor Love as a Practice of Solidarity and the Fratelli 2D Study Guide. He is also co-principal investigator for research grant from Fordham University's Taking Responsibility Initiative, aiming to measure moral injury caused by clergy sexual abuse and its cover up. David Karp is a professor in the School of Leadership and Education Sciences at the University of San Diego, where he also directs the Center for Restorative Justice and leads the Restorative Justice Network of Catholic Campuses, an organization that engages restorative justice scholars and practitioners in Catholic higher education across the United States. He is the author of over 100 articles and six books, the most notable of which for our purposes today is the little book of restorative justice for colleges and universities, repairing harm and rebuilding trust in response to student conduct. Heather Kimball is an assistant director for Title IX and sexual misconduct procedures in the Office of Student Conduct at Georgetown University and a member of the national planning team of the Restorative Justice Network of Catholic campuses. Prior to arriving at Georgetown in 2017, she served as graduate coordinator of student conduct at the University of Maryland and as a project assistant for sexual misconduct response at Carleton College. She has also served in various roles with the Peace Corps. 
Yuhuru Williams is a distinguished university chair and professor of history at the University of St. Thomas, where he also serves as founding director of the Racial Justice Initiative, a collaborative project with individuals and organizations engaged in reimagining a future in Minneapolis, St. Paul that is free from racial disparities and racial injustice. A graduate of the University of Scranton, he is the author of three and editor of four books. In addition, he writes regularly for the Huffington Post and Progressive Magazine and appears regularly as an expert in national and international news outlets. So we're gonna start the conversation off with you, Marcus. Thanks, I've been tasked with trying to put restorative and transformative practices in alignment with uh, Jesuit ministry and mission. And to do that, I'd like to try to connect five points, starting with Ignatius, who, although he might not have used these exact terms, would still recognize restorative and transformative practices as ways to replicate Jesus' example of reaching out to the margins and restoring people to right relationship in their communities. Ignatius of Loyola always invites us to use our imagination, not just to imagine the composition of place in our time or in the gospel stories, but ultimately how to use our free will to partner with Jesus' teaching and healing ministry. I think, for example, of Jesus encountering blind Bartimaeus in the 10th chapter of Mark's gospel. Jesus approaches Bartimaeus and asks, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus doesn't presume to know what Bartimaeus wants or needs. He doesn't see Bartimaeus as a problem to solve or a prop for his own advancement. Rather, Jesus honors Bartimaeus' Bartimaeus's dignity and powers Bartimaeus to lift his own voice, and Jesus listens. The first step in restorative and transformative practices is listening. It's an act of love that shows others they count, matter, and belong. Now fast forward to Father Pedro Rupe's 1973 address in Valencia, Spain, where he frames Jesuit education as formation for social justice, the public expression of how we love God and neighbor. Arupe insists that Jesuit education means forming people to adopt a firm resolve to be agents of change in society, not merely resisting unjust structures and arrangements, but actively undertaking to reform them. In other words, it's not enough to limit or avoid participation in, in unjust structures or practices. Justice remains out of reach until and unless those very structures are changed. It's a good reminder that restorative and transformative justice points to, to work on at least three scales, in ourselves, in our relationships, and our institutions, spanning the personal to the structural. Then 22 years ago, Superior General P Father Peter Hans Kolvenbach spoke at Santa Clara to build on and advance this legacy of formation for a faith that does justice. He claimed, quote, it is the nature of the university to be a social force end quote. And this social force should be oriented in the Jesuit tradition of faith and justice. This should inform how we teach and learn, what we research, and our institution's main concerns. All opportunities, Kolvenbach says, to set things right here on earth. Kolvenbach pointed out that injustice is rooted in a spiritual problem, and its solution requires a spiritual conversion of each one's heart and a cultural conversion toward a well-informed solidarity. I think serving as an important reminder of the inner work we all have to do to be vigilant against fear or self-doubt or shame, hatred or judgment, indifference or complacency, and also to be vigilant against the biases and blind spots that keep us from being, being attentive and responsive to the wounds that need healing in and around us. And also the need to break out of the us versus them mentality or zero sum thinking that continue to be obstacles to restorative and transformative justice. Then in 2016, the Jesuits gathered for General Congregation 36 and to elect a new superior general, Father Arturo Sosa. Over the course of their conversations and collective discernment, they chose to highlight the great ministry of reconciliation as the focal theme to sharpen the purpose and priorities of the mission and ministries of the Society of Jesus through, for example, the spiritual exercises to help people experience the depth and breadth of God's steadfast mercy, and then being moved and motivated to put compassion into action. 
to not only co offer comfort and strength to those experiencing degradation or deprivation, but also find ways to redress the harm done as a work of love. And then finally, and, and presently, you know, I think our, our Jesuit Pope, Francis, writes in his latest encyclical Fratelli Tutti, that the pandemic has given us an important opportunity to dream together of what more is possible, to stretch our vision of who we want to be personally and collectively on the other side of the pandemic, if we ever get there. He invites us to embrace this new opportunity to forge what he calls a culture of encounter that leads toward a culture of inclusive belonging. This does, doesn't just mean meeting people and fostering fruitful exchanges, but also helping people overcome a widespread fear of disagreement, even in the face of many obstacles posed by so, social fragility and fracture. Francis writes, quote, when conflicts are not resolved, but kept hidden or buried in the past, silence can lead us to complicity in grave misdeeds and sins. Authentic reconciliation does not flee from conflict, but is achieved in conflict, resolving it through dialogue and open, honest, and patient negotiation. Conflict between different groups, if it abstains from enmities and mutual hatred, gradually changes into an honest discussion of differences founded on a shared desire for justice, end quote. So taking these five points very briefly, I think this means we have a lot of work to do, but also a lot of purchase at Jesuit institutions for accounting in the, for the asymmetries in security and status, privilege and power on and off campus embracing a spirit of co-responsibility to create the conditions for safety, respect, and trust, seeing ourselves as bridge builders and peacemakers who are doing the work of reparation and reconciliation, which as Pope Francis says, give us new life and set us all free. I think this is just an, an important part of how we see ourselves and respond to the call to be persons for and with others. Thank you so much, Marcus. David? Uh, thank you. Uh, and Marcus, that was so interesting. Uh, and as a person who is a relatively new, this is my third year uh, working at a Catholic campus, it's so helpful to get this kind of uh, deeper contextualization of where restorative justice fits within the uh, larger mission and um, you know, Catholic social thought. Um, so I'm gonna do something totally different uh, and uh, tell a short story uh, to, I, I, hopefully it's a good segue to say like, well, you know, like, well, what, what do you mean exactly about uh, embracing conflict in some kind of uh, engaged way that leads to reconciliation? Uh, so many years ago, uh, I was involved with a case uh, of a student uh, who had gotten into a fight. Uh, and the circumstances were that the student uh, was uh, at a basketball game on campus. And at halftime, even though our school was winning, uh, uh, got into a altercation with a student from the uh, opposing team's school. And uh, the fight didn't get very far before it was uh, the two were pulled apart, um, uh, and um, and then he was you know quickly banished from the event, uh, as well as uh, banished from attending athletic events. Um, he was drunk at the time; that was a meaningful uh, part of it. Uh, and so, a little more context: uh, the student, his name is Sam, arrived. Um, on the bat, he was recruited and had a basketball scholarship. Uh, and um, he was, a, I knew him because he took a class from me. I liked him. He was a good guy. He was not a great student. It was not all in academically. He was all in on basketball. Uh, and because there were uh, GPA standards for uh, that you had to maintain for being on the team, uh, and he dropped below them. He was, after his first year, unable to play on the team. Um, 
and that was consequential, uh, you know, because uh, athletics were his lifeline to academic success. Uh, and without that, his coping mechanism uh, was primarily to stay connected to athletics by going to every game he could possibly go to. Uh, and so it was basketball games, it was soccer games, it was swimming meets, it was whatever was available, he was there. And, um, uh, and then he, he also had a habit of going with friends and, you know, cheering loudly and the cheers would turn to jeers and uh, drinking and so forth. And uh, the school where I taught was not a big school spirit, go to games kind of place. The stands were often empty. Uh, and this was, this mattered because in the, um, one of the other impacted parties in this event was uh, a woman whose name was Megan and her, she was the assistant athletic director. And she said that when Sam and his friends came into the gym, she could tell they were drunk. And she had that professional moment where she was deciding whether or not to kick them out or let them in. And a part of her, she said she made the bad call because she let them in, uh, but um, she really needed them, that she needed their cheering, the energy that they brought in the stands. And so there was value in having them there uh, in, in general. Uh, so Sam, was engaged in a restorative justice process. And that uh, process enabled the group to first gather those who were most impacted by the behavior and to explore uh, what could happen to make things right. And, uh, and so uh, this first step of having Megan, for example, attend and speak to her particular need, the way in which her community is impacted, meaning, the positive role that they played and the need she had for them to attend, and then the disruption of them being drunk and rowdy and causing fights um, was the, you know, the, the darker side of that uh, relationship. Um, there was work to be done uh, in repairing that relationship. There was work to be done in repairing the relationship between the schools and the, the student who was in the, you know, was the object of his um, aggressive energy. Uh, so apologies to be made. I think that the most interesting element of this work came not only in the identification of what the harm was, but in the collaborative process of figuring out what to do and recognizing the interconnection or interdependence uh, that they shared. So in this case with, the, uh, with um, Megan and Sam, she recognized that his lifeline to school was athletics, that he couldn't play on the basketball team, and that standard policy is a policy of progressive exclusion, meaning you can't play, you can't attend games, you can't live on campus, you can't attend the school anymore. Uh, and so that's our model for punishment. Uh, but for his success, uh, progressive inclusion is actually the restorative strategy. That is, how do we strengthen the lifeline? How do we connect you in positive ways? And out of this, they, they, they developed a, a, a strategy for him to um, check in with her, to um, uh, take a leadership role uh, in, uh, in the stands with some kind of designated you know, uh, title. And I actually, that was a, it was kind of a magical moment to see the smile on his face emerge when he thought he could play, that he could be acknowledged for playing a positive role and that he could lean into it. Um, I don't think this was well addressed in that particular restorative process, uh, but is really important is that every restorative process should not only address the immediate harms and, and then address the needs of the particular people involved, but also to explore the deeper issues. And in this case, it's really around um, the systematic models of exclusion uh, and our tendency to establish accountability standards like unless you maintain a 2.0 GPA, you can't play on a team without simultaneously building systems of supports that 
ensure success across the board. So we're always in, uh, I think, in a restorative process, having a mindset towards success and not just towards exclusion. And so how do we build communities in which, you know, the academics become just as important as the athletics? And how do the two support one another rather than uh, it being a zero sum game between them? And then I want to just, uh, you know, kind of wind this up by saying that this process is kind of a typical restorative process on campus, meaning that it is re reactive or responsive after the fact to an incident. And really the, the deeper question and the restorative work is building communities using restorative practices in a way that are uh, prevention oriented. Like what would have needed to be in place first that would have prevented this situation from happening uh, that Sam would have felt connected enough to the school that he, he wouldn't have been acting out in the way that he did. Uh, and so much of the campus work is really building foundations of trust, building communication skills or relationship skills, uh, building people's stake in the community, whether it's students or faculty or staff, uh, and building social systems of social support uh, that uh, prevent harm from happening in the first place. So I will pause there and back to you, Shay. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for that story. Heather? Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, wow, I've just been taking all of this in and I'm going to have to remember what I, <laughs> what, what I want to talk about. I work at Georgetown University in our Office of Student Conduct, and, um, and that means that I I work with responses to student misconduct and, and especially my role works with our Title IX and sexual misconduct complaint processes at Georgetown. Our, our Office of Student Conduct works with our Title IX office really closely in facilitating the formal complaint processes for sexual misconduct and sexual harm. Um, and so I have had a lot of opportunity in, in my work to see how those formal adjudication investigation processes processes work and um and they don't always work you know i think what um i come into the the conversations on restorative justice with with the lens of of seeing students who have who have come to to us to our office to colleagues saying i i have experienced some harm this is this was wrong and I feel like I need to do something. Um, and what we then institutionally, and this isn't unique to Georgetown, it's um, true for all of our institutions. What we have as an answer then is that we can sort of turn around and say, here's, here's the hammer. This is the tool that we have. This is the one tool that we have when someone says, I, I feel like I need to do something. Whether that something is, I need this person to understand how this hurt me, or I need this person to not ever do this again, or, or I need to not see this person as I'm walking across campus, or I need to not have this person contact me. There are so many different needs that students come in with, um, but, regardless of the particulars of their need, we say, oh, you need to do something. Here is the something that we have. Um, and, and this has become more the case, if anything, as, as the Department of Education has um, in with, at various times, various types of intent, um, increasingly regulated the work around how campuses are responding to sexual harm. And so, so what we have is, is an increasingly judicial, increasingly adversarial um, tool that we can use to, to support and, and respond to students and to provide some semblance of justice for, um, for all kinds of harm. We have this one, this one tool. Um, and, and what draws me to, to restorative justice specifically in this sphere of of sexual harm is that is that it's insufficient. 
there, there are some situations where that tool will, will meet the need or may, may meet the need. Um, but there are many, many other situations for students where, um, where it's just not the right tool. And um, it's, it's also, it's not a tool that centers the experiences and the needs of the folks involved. And what restorative justice offers is an opportunity to turn around to that student and say, tell me more about what you need. And how do we, how do we partner together to shape a process uh, that is going to best address those specific needs that you have, that's going to see you and your experiences as an individual and, um, and, sh and shape a response around, around that, around you, around the person or persons who have caused, caused this harm and, and the others who are also involved. And I think that's a, that's a second piece that really draws me to restorative justice in this sphere is that what we also see, and this will sound familiar to many of you, is that our processes allow us to address the complainant and the respondent, those two individuals. And, and apart from maybe interviewing them as witnesses, doesn't do anything to address the ripples of harm or the effects that have been experienced by, by their friends, by the, the community, the group, the student organization that they're both a part of, um, the, uh, the maybe identity group that they're a part of on campus that then is experiencing a lot of hard questions and, and conflict spinning off from this interpersonal harm. Um, and restorative processes allow us to sort of open their aperture and say, where, where, anywhere, is there is there harm? Is there impact? And and what are those needs? And how do we um, move toward um, supporting folks in in addressing those those needs? Um, so those are the those are the reasons that I that I come to this. Um, I'm excited to engage in in greater conversation with with this panel um, and and maybe more more storytelling as well. But I'll pause there for now. Thank you, Heather. Uhuru? Thank you. I'm probably going to echo um, Marcus a lot in my remarks. And I want to share a couple of slides uh, just in, in the way that I've been thinking about this question. It's less on restorative justice and more on the moment that we find ourselves in nationally, uh, globally, with regard to um, questions about racial justice and how they permeate all aspects of our um, existence in this moment, from the social determinants of health that we associate with the um, response to the pandemic in communities of color, to questions of racial justice associated with policing, um, to a range of other issues that um, my colleagues uh, have in particular have raised this afternoon. I always like to tell young people when we talk about this, uh, James Baldwin was famous for saying the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you can alter even by a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. And I think restorative justice at its core is changing the way that we think about exactly what my colleagues described, how we respond, um, not just to the injury that's done to an individual, but how that becomes an opportunity to affirm our values as a community. And that's very important. Um, this is happening not just on our campuses, but it also projects outward. It's how people see us. It's how we wanna show up in the world. And we have to really begin to think about um, the way that we uh, have a call in culture. And that when we talk about restorative justice, when Heather talked about that hammer, it's just not only the punitive response, but how you heal community and use those as an opportunity to communicate fundamental values that we associate with Jesuit education. I say that because a lot of times, and uh, my thinking on this really developed in 2014 when I was at Fairfield University in the aftermath of the killing of Michael Brown, when our students, uh, students of color staged a die-in at the library on the 10th of December in the middle of finals. And I was disappointed in the way that their uh, fellow classmates treated them. They were engaged in this um, symbolic act of, of protest. And there were students who literally walked over the students who were laying down in the corridor and complained about finals. We got letters from parents complaining about um, the civil action taking place on campus. And there was this fundamental question um, that was posed at that time by the students themselves that, is this an institution of higher learning where the ultimate goal is for us to 
um, be focused on our grades? Or are we supposed to really be taking uh, the, the foundational ideas that we associate with Jesuit education and rhetoric seriously? If we're really driven or called to be men and women for others, persons for others, then this was a moment where uh, there's a wound crying out and the response from the overall community was, we're not interested. Um, that's a problem. Uh, particularly as we seek to be more diverse and more inclusive. I say that because part of our rhetoric is language like go forth and set the world on fire, which we take from St. Ignatius. But I quote Baldwin to you here, do I really want to be integrated into a burning house? Uh, sometimes when we think about this language, and it can be very dangerous when you think about it, I'm going to phrase this in two ways, one that's provocative, another that's probably not as provocative. What good is it to tell young people to go forth and set the world on fire if you're not telling them what needs to be illuminated or what needs to be burned? And I don't want to use fire in a destructive sense. I want to talk about it more in the illuminating sense of how do we illuminate those areas of our society where our young people need to be bringing um, their passion and insight to? How do we create spaces of inquiry um, that provide a range of experiences, a range of opportunity engagement with broader questions about social justice and, and leveraging um, the intellectual tradition, the Catholic intellectual tradition in a way that inspire young people to take these issues on. Um, and I say that all of that because I think part of the problem is, and again, uh, this was spoken to earlier, Father Colvinback put it best when he said, the real measure of Jesuit universities lies in who our students become. We ask these three fundamental questions, which at the core are what Heather talked about, about community. Who am I? Whose am I? And who am I called to be? Restorative justice, in some sense, has to bring us back to those fundamental questions when a harm has been committed um, within the community, but also as we're looking external to things that are happening in the, in the larger community and students are asking, what's the response of the university to this? Where do we stand? Why are, is this simply a statement um, about what happened or are we examining and using this as an opportunity to really engage in the process of examination that inter interrogates what our values are and if we're living those values? That's all important because it's interesting to me, and I'm not saying that these works aren't important, that Jesuit universities in particular have looked externally to answer some of these questions and some of the um, books that have come out in recent years that address issues like this. Robin D'Angelo, White Fragility, Ibram Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist. But I would submit to you that they've missed the opportunity to dig deep into the very foundations of Jesuit education. Um, in fact, the 12 characteristics of learning in Jesuit tradition that speak directly to what Ibram Kendi talks about, how to be an anti-racist. It means to take action. So you can find in the works of so many contemporary thinkers on issues of race and restorative justice practices, these foundations. Um, what at the core is the pursuit of excellence if it isn't thinking differently uh, uh, in the way that Baldwin proposed about um, the way that the world has changed and how we need to adapt and change with it if we're, we are to live our values. Um, how do we talk about a commitment to service? How do we talk about the development of personal potential or contemplative vision informed by hope if we're not doing that? Um, most importantly, how do we link faith with justice in ways that are meaningful if we're not engaged in that, in that work? As a historian, my work pivots around historical recovery. The idea that part of the reason that we continue to face challenges in our contemporary moment is that we don't know our history and we don't confront our history. Um, it's always interesting to me to hear people talk about us living in unprecedented times when Baldwin himself was responding um, in 1960 to, uh, among other things, this report uh, by the National Commission on the Causes of the Prevention of Violence. So appropriate right now. Um, and at that time, what this commission wrote is that our most serious challenges to date have been external. This kind, the kind this strong and resourceful country could unite against. While serious external dangers remain, the graver threats today are internal, haphazard urbanization, racial discrimination, disfiguring of the environment, unprecedented interdependence and dislocation of human identity, motivation created by an affluent society, all resulting in a rising tide of individual and group violence. It is a portrait of where we are in 2020, 2021, 2022, from the Oscars to the uh, unprecedented, uh, again, that people love to use that language, but challenges over um, issues of violence against communities of color, to the social determinants of health, to again, even questions of environment that we're not connecting, I think in meaningful ways and ways that people understand the Jesuit mission to be more than about branding, but also um, at, about formation at its core. Uh, my colleague mentioned earlier, Father Pedro Arupe. I think it's important that Father Arupe in 1973 also talked about the importance of reducing privilege. So much that we associate again with modern or discourse on 
um, dealing with anti-racism or white privilege at its core has its roots in these foundational ideas. If I had more time, um, I would share uh, with you this, but I do love that Father Rupe says that all of us have a degree of privilege and that we need to leverage that privilege in ways that uh, promote justice. Um, and finally, I want to read the third one to you here because this is the core of Ibram Kendi's thesis about anti-racism, an attitude not simply of refusal but counterattack against, counter against injustice, the idea that you have to take action, a decision to work with others toward the dismantling of unjust social structures so that the weak, the oppressed, the marginalized of this world may be set free, that they'll have real voice, real opportunity, real opportunity to feel like they're part of um, the community not from the standpoint of, of uh, marketing, but from the, from the real genuine uh, adoption of the foundational values that we associate with Jesuit mission and identity. Again, this is, I have, I have conversations with folks who say, well, this seems to be a deviation from our mission or deviation from Catholic social teaching. Again, it's already been talked about today, read for in its in its entirety. And this is what uh, uh, the Pope is commending us to do and to think about in this moment, very much in conversation with Baldwin and with Arupe and with a number of other thinkers who wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't necessarily put in this discourse. And I wanna conclude by saying, we're not talking about the fire last time, we're talking about the fire this time. Many of those challenges that I read to you from 1960 remain with us and they're racialized in, in meaningful ways. They uh, have gender components in meaningful ways that we have to address. I think at the core then what we're talking about is what Isabel Wilkerson asks in her book, um, Cast, when she uses that very famous image of, the, of a Nazi rally where there's one person in the crowd who has his arms folded and is not engaging in kind of group think. And it's this fundamental question that commits us to think about this both as a problem that we have to address internally and externally to the university. Why we need to grow and how do we think that we, um, how we need to engage externally with those um, areas in our society that really, um, again, if we think about the foundational mission of our institutions, we should be addressing. Wilkerson wrote, unaddressed, this is both in terms of the university itself and externally. The ruptures and diagonal cracks in the old house will not fix themselves. The toxins will not go away, but rather they will spread, leach, mutate as they already have. When people live in an old house, they come adjusted to the idiosyncrasies and outright dangers skulking in the old structure. It's like the story uh, that David shared with us about the student who, uh, and how we become comfortable in kind of allowing things to continue in the way that, we, that they did because we're uncomfortable in disrupting tradition and we're called to be disruptors in that way, to shed light. Last but not least, she concludes, live with it long enough and the unthinkable becomes normal. Exposed over the generations, we learn to believe the incomprehensible is the way life is supposed to be. And I would argue controversially, I may add, and I recognize that this is not a very nice thing to say, that's what happens when we don't interrogate mission and identity in a way that authentically allows us to look at issues of LBGTQ communities, students of color, um, talk about issues of poverty, really uh, ask fundamental questions about what is the role of a business school at a Jesuit institution as opposed to another institution? What is the role of an engineering school at a Jesuit institution? What is the role of the core curriculum at a Jesuit institution? And how do we do discipline differently? How do we create the call and culture so that student who's engaged in that behavior um, is bought back into the whole and has a better understanding of our values and what it, what it is that we promote um, in terms of our identity? Baldwin probably said it best in uh, The Fire Next Time when he wrote, it's rare indeed that people give, most people guard and keep. That's how people think about the history, legacy, and traditions associated with education. But we really need to be disruptors in that work as well and to begin to think in practical terms about how we leverage um, really what is the best part of Jesuit education and that is its focus on human dignity, on Catholic social teaching, and ultimately on helping to craft individuals for others. Thank you. Well, thank you, Yuhuru. We're all gonna go home now. <laughs> Let that all soak in. No, I appreciate, I appreciate um, all of your um, comments. That was, um, you know, um, you know, quite. I mean, moving. It was allowing us the opportunity to to reflect and to act. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about about the action and um, moving forward and, 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 and really tie it towards how we can um, use these practices to act um, um, as you lift it up. Um, but I wanted to open up um, the, you know, make sure that everyone um, knows that you can use the Q&A function so that you can um, ask questions on in the Zoom room. And I'm gonna start you all off with some of the questions based upon um, um, 
some of the things that you've just recently said, but could you talk a little bit, uh, and, and it doesn't matter um, if you all could chime in and you don't all have to chime in, but you know, I just want to talk a little bit about the key points of overlap between restorative and transformative justice practices and what makes restorative justice distinct um, from transformative justice. And if you don't mind starting off, David, because there was something that actually that you said um, that made me um, think about the line when you move past sort of the line of the restorative justice practice where it's, um, it's you know, maybe that interpersonal, the person who caused the, uh, the harm and the person who's trying to repair the harm into some of the more um, system, systemic and structural work that we need to do and um, some of the action um, that Uhuru uh, was lifting up. But could you, could you um, answer that? What's the difference between restorative or what are the, or, or even the points of overlap between restorative and transformative justice? You know, there are two that really stand out for me. And one is the one you're highlighting right now, uh, which is that the transformative justice movement, which is really a grassroots movement, um, has a critique of restorative justice that's been really helpful. And that is that many restorative um, programs and practices have a micro level focus. And so in my story about Sam, the focus is on what harm he caused, how can he take responsibility for making things right? Um, you know, what impact has his behavior had on others? Uh, and doesn't automatically ask the deeper questions around the conditions that made it possible or likely or incentivized Sam's behavior in the first place, like um, the disqualification uh, from uh, his role on the basketball team, the reason that he you know, came to the school. Uh, and so without acknowledging that, and of course, this micro macro thing is not mutually exclusive. He, he had a role to play. He, he didn't study for certain tests and he got grades he got. And, you know, there's, um, he, he's got accountability for that. But the restorative move is, um, is the coupling of accountability with support. And I think the transformative move is to make sure that the systems that exist or the structures that exist are equitable, inclusive, and all of that. So I think that's one. Um, the other one I think about uh, RJ and TJ is that's really important is that um, transformative justice, that, that grassroots movement has really been organized uh, for people who are either not going to um, have access to a justice system, whether it's on campus or the criminal justice system, whatever it is, um, either because that system is biased against them uh, or because their experience is, is that it's not going to be helpful to them. Uh, in fact, it could be, you know, like further harmful. Uh, so transformative has this premise that says people can organize justice for themselves. Communities can organize justice for themselves and they don't have to be dependent. Uh, you know, like on, um, you know, Yuru was pointing out Black Lives Matter and this motivation around that student protests. Um, you know, there are people who are simply not going to call the police. And, uh, and, and so a simple like, well, just trust them the next time, you know, they're there to help you is just not gonna work. Uh, and so can you build opportunities for people uh, that enable them to seek responses uh, um, to injustices uh, at, at a local level? It's like, for example, you know, I got a call a, a couple of years ago now from uh, a restorative practitioner at a university who said, I've got two students who've come to me, um, you know, one has harmed the other. They both want a restorative process, understand what it is, but they're both undocumented. And they're nervous that if they participate in this campus system, they're gonna be on record in some way and there's gonna be real risk uh, to them as a result. So, you know, what, what can we do? And if there was a transformative justice grassroots community 
that a campus could refer to that doesn't put them into Maxient or some other record keeping system uh, that would enable them to get their issue addressed meaningfully. That, I think that's what TJ has been um, you know, advocating for. So some people would say you can't have a transformative justice process on a college campus or in a criminal justice system because that's antithetical to the premise um, that TJ is organized outside of systems and RJ is organized within to operate within systems. And then others would you know, really point to the, the theory of TJ that says you cannot do restorative justice at the micro level. You have to do it at a macro level as well. Thank you so much. Yeah, and one I think what what point particularly struck me about what you said before is was moving from the the um, progressive exclusionary um, you know um, uh, processes like in in our in the punitive systems within the institution to a progressive inclusionary processes. So that takes it from the restorative and the one on one. So like, how do we apply this across the board? What are ways in which we can continue to invite folk in? And if we're restoring, we're reconciling, we're reconnecting, um, what is it about our um, processes or systems? How can we transform those so that they actually refre reflect um, those practices? So I'm going to go uh, go to the um, to the Q&A. Someone, um, and I think this is a great segue from that uh, overlap between restorative and transformative justice. Uh, and it says, I have had recent experience with BIPOC folks being left very dissatisfied with a restorative justice outcome that they felt was insufficient. They felt dismissed without the inclusion of a punitive justice outcome. Is there a role for punitive justice within a restorative justice model? Uh, I, I can at least get this conversation started here. So I, I really learned about restorative justice from Janine Geske, uh, who uh, does this in a law school setting, and kind of inspired by healing circles, you know, a, a Native American tradition where people can go around and, and tell their truth without being interrupted or contested or challenged. And, and um, you know, this model can be therapeutic and healing in a lot of ways because it's important for people to exercise their voice and, and assert their agency. But there are a number of um, obstacles, including, you know, one that RJ poses, you know, in my own experience and, and, and the research I've been doing on clergy sexual abuse and, uh, you know, walking with students through the Title IX process, one of the real big challenges is when uh, perpetrators of harm express little to no remorse. And, and a lot of, uh, you know, victim survivors kind of feel robbed of, of, of justice because there's, there's no contrition on the part of the perpetrator. I think this is especially rough in, in Catholic circles. Um, you know, I've heard stories of, of perpetrators of clergy sexual abuse who would say something to the effect of, you know, I, I've gone to reconciliation, I've done my penance and I owe you nothing. And, and that kind of stonewalling um, really just kind of um, almost, I think, um, prevents restorative justice from happening even before it can begin. And I think so with a punitive dimension, I, I think it has to, it invites this question of, of our means and our ends. You know, what I appreciate about this vision of restorative justice uh, as, as part of the work of reconciliation is that it reminds us, you know, reconciliation is the ultimate goal. We may not arrive there, you know, it's aspirational, um, but that kind of integral holistic healing is probably beyond our reach, but that doesn't mean we don't reach for it, right? It's aspirational like that asymptotic curve that gets us closer and closer to the axis without ever arriving toward it. So I think it, it's not a once for all event. You know, you don't sit down and have a conversation and think like our job here is done. And similarly, I don't think you can, you know, there are boxes to check whether it's the punitive dimension that, that RJ is asking about or, or any other dimension. Um, I mean, I, I think affirming the agency of the people involved is, is really important and, and that's gotta be part of it. But if, if, the reconciliation is is the telos or the goal that we're headed toward. I think it also has to be the means by which we try to get that work accomplished. And so I, I do have a little bit of concern about the role of the punitive uh, in restorative justice because it can, it, it can, I think, impose a sense of shame on people, you know, like to rub your no, you know, people's nose and in, in what they've done wrong. Um, rather than to really help them come to understanding about the depth and breadth of the wounds that they caused in, in a real gesture, I think, of empathy and understanding that I think, you know, when we really get to that kind of understanding, 
then that should express, I would think, kind of the, the remorse and the repentance that can then kind of inspire the work toward redressing the harm done and doing that in conversation across not just the, you know, the, the perpetrator and victim binary, but all of the parties who are affected um, by, by bringing them together and, and trying to help them figure out like, you know, you know how, what does healing look like? What, what, does, what does this require from all of us? Um, you know, we have a, a role to play in this. I, I always think of, you know, that, that line from Archbishop Desmond Tutu, you know, given all of his work with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission after apartheid, he would often say that the work of justice is like an orchestra and everyone has an instrument to play. And even if you have the rhythm of a corpse, like I do, or, you know, no, no musical talent whatsoever, Tutu would say, you have to bang the hell out of the triangle for justice at the very least. And so I think when, when we resort to the punitive dimension, I think it, it can cast people out or, or make them, it can kind of strip them of their agency in some ways that makes it harder for them to see what, what role do you have to play in, in trying to make the constructive turn to making up for this. Alternatively, you know, sometimes I would imagine that that only a punitive sanction would really do the work of, of trying to show the gravity of the wound or be part of the prevention efforts. And I think that prevention is, is really uh, important. You know, not that like we're punishing you by, you know, making you scrub bathroom floors with a toothbrush, but maybe the punitive in terms of here are the consequences to keep you safe so that you're not violating other people in their vulnerability or, or victimizing people, but then also keep other people safe from you. So those are a couple of thoughts, but by no means do I mean to, you know, mon monopolize our conversation here. I can jump in briefly. Um, Marcus, that was also beautifully said. Um, just as I think about this from the sort of student discipline or student conduct perspective, um, a couple things come to mind. One is that I think, and I, as I said in my initial remarks, I really intentionally think about restorative justice as as another tool. I think what I what I don't hear folks saying is is let's in, we need to entirely get rid of our formal complaint process. Those there there is a role for for those those processes that are investigating and adjudicating um, and. And so there, there may still be a role for that, right? But that there is value in having additional options that, that can better fit a particular situation or particular set of needs. Um, the other thing that I think about is that in, um, in my learning around restorative justice, uh, the, the work of Marshall Rosenberg and um, nonviolent communication has been really central. And, and I think that, that what that empowers us to do, what some of those tools um, through nonviolent communication allow us to do is to interrogate um, the needs. And so when, 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 I, when I read that, you know, that a group is feeling dismissed without the inclusion of a punitive justice outcome, the questions that come to mind for me, and these are curiosities, not a diagnosis of, of what someone may be thinking, but are questions around what is the need that's expressed there? Um, you know, a punitive outcome is, a, is maybe a strategy, but what's, what's the need that someone is trying to address by saying, I, I need this punitive or I want this punitive outcome. Um, and once we, once we can, can look at and hold that need, then there may be additional options that, that come to light or that become available that may even better address that need. You know, is this a need perhaps for, as Marcus said, for rec really recognition and maybe public recognition of the seriousness of, of the harm and the actions that were taken? Is it a need for Separation. I mean, I don't. I don't think that it's impossible that a restorative process doesn't result in someone being removed or separated from a community for a period of time if that's addressing the the needs that are present um, in in that instance. Um, so those those are a couple thoughts. The last thought that I will share is that I think that one of the hardest things for um, for administrators who and student conduct administrators I'll speak for specifically is that restorative justice really asks us to let go of our ownership of other people's harm and other people's um, 
solutions to the, and needs for, for addressing that harm. And that is, that's hard for us to do, right? We are, we are, are living in and working in a system where we have professionalized justice and we are the professionals and, and it, it can be sort of scary to say, ultimately, I'm, that may not be what I would choose or that may not be what I would want, but, but you own your own experience and your own harm. And, and therefore you are part owner with, with the person who caused harm in, in finding the solutions that are going to meet those needs. And, you know, I've, I've signed my name to, to um, alternative agreements where some of the components I think like, I, I don't know why you want that, want that, but, but that's not for me to decide. I have to let go of that. And I have to let go of, and I think that's true here. I think, especially for, for white administrators to be saying like, I don't get to define what BIPOC folks are saying they need when they've experienced harm. I am here to partner with them and to, to be someone who maybe is, is expert in some of these processes or who has can offer some of these processes to help get at the root of what, what you may need, but I don't get to own that outcome. I was just going to add very, very quickly. I think I, I like what Heather said because she lives in the space of, of dealing with the persons who've been directly impacted by the um, whatever that wound is, but then there's the community. And I think often what we see, particularly with uh, BIPOC students, often with uh, uh, female students with regard to sexual assault, is this, these lingering questions about why isn't the university being transparent about what happened to this individual? We simply want to know that a process was followed and that this person has been properly dealt with, which runs into all kinds of practical issues that we deal with as administrators. So it's FERPA and we can't share this and we can't share that, which leaves those communities feeling even more um, vulnerable and marginalized because there's not, we're asking them to accept on faith that, that justice has been done, that the person who's responsible has been punished accordingly. And then when we do some practices such as healing circles and other things that are happening at the same time, there's still that core group of people who go, this is wonderful that you're trying to address this part of it, but we live in a world where um, we look outside the campus and people of color routinely are um, treated to unfair uh, justice practices and we can't find out what's happening on our campus and we simply want to know, you know, what, peel back the curtain and let us know what the, what the outcome of this um, particular instance is. But I think part of the, uh, the, the challenge there is that um, this is part about this is the part about really affirming our community values and having that opportunity to deal with the trauma that the community as a whole is impacted by, whether people acknowledge it or not. And I think what happens a lot of times is faculty deal with this in ways that um, aren't tangible or evident in the very beginning. Students come to class or stop coming to class. Um, uh, you have, you know, uh, various groups of students or pockets of students who are then looking for um, opportunity to have discourse in spaces that don't lend themselves toward a reaffirmation of who we are as a community. And then you have this endless uh, stream of statements that come out from administrators where we're paying lip service to, you know, kind of policy statements that don't have anything to back them up with regard to, I simply want to know whether this person is still on campus, particularly if they've done something that's that's egregious. So I think there have to be kind of multiple levels in the way that we deal with that. And we should always pause to ask the fundamental questions about um, community trauma and how any one of these incidents, particularly we're talking about racial incidents or that's an assault on the very cornerstones of the foundations of the institution as a whole. There should always be a response from um, various sectors, residence life in conjunction with campus ministry, in conjunction with faculty and administration to say, we just take this opportunity to reaffirm our values. This is what it means. The reason we pursue restorative justice is that we hope that you're imagining along with us a world in which um, we rethink these policies and procedures which have inflicted harm on communities for centuries because we weren't in the process of, of aiming for something that was better than what we have now. What we have now is sorely lacking. I think there's opportunity in that. Thank you so much, Uhuru. And I think you um, connected one of the, I mean, one of the things that um, was lifted up in the, uh, the Q&A was, how, can you speak to um, the trauma-informed component of these practices? And I think you were able to, to hit on some of those, but I was thinking about some of the things that you were saying, um, Heather, in terms of sort of um, the position that we have to take in um, 
uh, in some of these processes, right? You know, I, I'm a social justice mediator. Um, you know, I'm also, you know, a mediator for sometimes for the state, all these different things. And there's specific roles and regulations and things that you have to sort of abide by in doing this work. But at the same time, there's still ways in which we can incorporate and lead through a, a trauma-informed lens um, in, our, in our, our council or in our coaching and things of that sort. Can you all speak a bit to, um, and Yuhuru, you did a bit, um, um, uh, can you talk a little bit about even on the micro and macro level ways in which um, we can lead through a trauma-informed lens? Yeah, I, I mean, I can get things started uh, quickly. I think this is a really important question. So thanks, Louise, because I, I think, uh, you know, so many people are coming to this conversation thinking of justice with some relation to to vengeance. You know, like if you think of our criminal justice system, it was kind of built on this idea that that justice requires exacting some kind of vengeance or having this punitive model. And when we take a trauma informed lens, I think we have a better understanding of of the wounds so that we can do the healing work better. And, and trauma has a lot of different manifestations. You know, for some people it's fear-based, for others it's more shame-based. But I think thinking about it through a couple different levels will help us kind of um, make some important connections. You know, on the first hand, it, it can really mess with people's sense of identity and their sense of worthiness. Um, but it also can can mess with people's even like their own reasoning, you know, and, and being able to make decisions. Uh, and what I hear more most often from, from survivors of sexual violence um, is really kind of this sense of futility. And, and I think too, um, th this can also be true in, in a lot of regards for students of color at a predominantly white institution. And, and that loss of agency or the loss of futility or, or being traumatized or triggered, um, you know, like at Xavier, we've had a couple um, uh, vandalization uh, ex experiences with vandals who are putting white supremacy uh, paraphernalia around campus. And it, it just persists in this sense of students of color not feeling safe. And, and that, that, you know, kind of the, the wound on top of the wound or the, the trigger on top of the trigger. And, and this is, is not only a, like a trauma is not only a personal experience, it also affects relationships and, and the loss of really being able to feel a sense of safety and trust. And, and people become more on edge and on guard. And when you when you lose that ability to feel really safe or to trust, I think that becomes a, a real obstacle to restorative justice or transformative justice that requires so much authenticity and vulnerability. And if we don't account for those conditions, um, you know, through a trauma informed lens or or just uh, as I briefly mentioned, the asymmetries and security and status and privilege and power by so many people across a college campus, you know, who has tenure, who doesn't, um, you know, by race and sexual orientation and, you know, gender and all of these things, physical ability, that we, we have to think about this, you know, individually, interpersonally, but that's then also institutionally. And I think trauma also makes it harder for people to trust institutions and to trust that their best interests are at heart. Uh, in, in the students that I've worked with, especially through the Title IX process, I mean, it is so painful when a perpetrator just transfers out of the school and then, you know, the, the survivor victim has, has almost no recourse to actually work toward holding that person accountable. And they feel in some ways that like the institution has failed them. And we know statistically that survivors of sexual violence are, are much less likely to actually graduate because of all these boundaries that are partly emotional uh, health related and mental health related. Also, you know, tr trouble getting access to, to academic support, but also I think really kind of this over, overarching sense of betrayal. And, and so I, again, Louise, thanks for your question because I, I think it does raise for us, you know, some important considerations of, of what is it going to take in, in the face of so many really pervasive experiences of betrayal, you know, by experienced by people of color, experience of survivors of sexual violence and, and, and so many other violations of, of people's dignity and agency is what is it gonna take for us to really help people regain a sense, a, an authentic sense, not just, you know, t tokenism or, or lip service, but a real sense of safety and trust, you know, to feel respected and to, you know, to help them grow in reasserting their agency and not just to do that individually. You know, I always think of that line from Bell Hooks, rarely if ever are any of us healed in isolation, healing is an act of communion. And so I think, you know, trying to figure out how do we do this work, not just on the micro or the macro, but it, within ourselves, in our relationships, and then, you know, seeing our institutions as anchor institutions for our communities, you know, ad intra, 
you know, within campus, but also in how these are public facing institutions and, and what they offer to our wider civic communities as well. Thank you, Marcus. Did anyone else want to add to leading through a trauma informed lens? Okay. So the next question is this from what um, has been said, it sounds like transformative justice calls for both macro solutions and also for working outside of systems. Within a transformative justice model, is there room for offering macro solutions within systems and leveraging systems as a means of change? Well, I can, I can pick up the thread because I think I started at that one, that, <laughs> those little distinctions. Um, I, th I think I first want to say that in terms of practice, actual practice, when you um, when you look at the transformative justice methods, like what do people do when they participate in a transformative justice process? It's pretty much the same as a restorative justice process. That We're not talking about um, alternative models in terms of how to facilitate uh, a, a, an accountability process, like whether you call it a restorative process or community accountability process. Um, that uh, part of it is just about where where that's happening, who's in charge, how does it get, you know, how does the case evolve or get referred or that kind of thing. Um, so at that level, there there are not much there's not much different. Um, and then at a broader level, when we think about transformative justice as movement, it's really a kind of a call to action, challenging restorative systems to be broader in their thinking about the questions that they're asking, the solutions that they're inviting. Um, and maybe it's back to the question about the um, a uh, BIPOC community that was dissatisfied with the restorative outcome. You know, we don't know. I don't. We don't know the details of that uh, of that situation. But we we would have questions. You know, like were um, what was the process? Uh, who was included? How what what were they invited to do as part of this? Like, how much were they offered the opportunity to envision a meaningful? Uh, resolution that would be satisfying to them. Um, and of course, we we live in a very punitive society. And so we're very enculturated into this idea that, well, it, real accountability is the tough stuff. And then the restorative stuff is the like fluffy stuff when you can do it in, in easy cases. And um, and I think it's a, it's a pretty radical shift in the ways that Heather was pointing to, to say, um, we're not going to own this process. We're going to host this opportunity for people to really figure out what's meaningful to them. That's pretty radical. Uh, and, um, and we're going to try and think about uh, uh, ways to hold people accountable that don't cause further harm. And these are really hard uh, to get our heads around. But in, in my experience, when you create the opportunities, people lean in, meaning they're like, really? Like, I really? Like, I can say the thing I actually want and not just, you know, an item from the menu of standard punishments. Uh, and that's a really exciting uh, process and speaks to what is like energetically positive about restorative justice, that it's not just about the, the negative, you know, the harms and identifying harms, but also about very unexpected creative solutions that meet people's very customized specific needs. And, um, uh, you know, and, and so those needs can operate at the level of, you know, like I have something I need for me to feel safe right now. Um, but also I have a need to be in a community that looks different from how it operates now. And I, you know, we can't make magic happen, but we can think hard as a group about well, what would the next steps be to make this community operate differently than it has before. And so I think that the, the roundabout answer to the question is the transformative justice community is saying, let's be sure to ask these questions every time that 
how can we collectively work towards making this a different place? How can we use this instance when people are upset and angry and feel a sense of institutional betrayal and distrust? Um, how can we leverage that energy towards you know, practical, meaningful solutions that uh, we can implement you know, as soon as possible? Thank you, David. So we're gonna um, wrap up, but I'm gonna ask um, uh, a question that Jude Jones just lifted up, and I'm gonna ask that um, you know you all can integrate some of your um, your final remarks um, in answering this question. But do you have any thoughts about how these practices can inform other dimensions of campus life and classroom experience, where imperfections don't necessarily rise to the level of transgressions, but they could benefit from aspects of these processes that break down gulfs between human beings. Um, and I find myself as a practitioner, right, I'm an administrator and, and working on, um, you know, bringing the campus together across difference, um, using components of both restorative and transformative justice practices, but it might not be the entire, the full process. And so really using these elements to inform how we bring the community together have been really beneficial to me. So can you all speak to that? Um, as we as we uh, uh, close out today, I'll go first, and I'll be very brief. I think Shah, you've done some really um, exciting things in your career that speak to this, and so I would say if anybody was looking at that, they I would commend them to take a look at some of the things that you've done in the spaces where you've been. The the one thing that I will mention that I think is most important is this idea that this is something that's shared across the different um, areas in the university. This can't be something that simply lives in. Um, residence life or in um, academic affairs. This is something that really needs to be kind of community, uh, you know, part of, of how we identify uh, as a community as a whole. And I think sometimes they're segmented in ways that are not affirmative of the idea that you came to the University of X and that the university works in concert to deal with all the members of the community um, in terms of how the community has been harmed by some transgression that's taken place. I think you can do that in a couple of ways. The one that I'll, I'll just mention today is that universities should find a way as a community strategically um, at least two or three times a year to rearticulate its value system in relation to that and to do so in a way that again, doesn't simply live with, um, you know, it's happening in the syllabi and it's happening with uh, campus ministries and it's happening in residence life. No, you're, you're finding ways for all of those areas to speak with one voice about what it means to be a member of this community and what our values are in relation to that. And I think that then at least creates a framework and a language for people when things like this to happen to know that if it happened in the classroom, people are understanding this as part of a community or university response, not just a response of the, the any one unit. If I can just piggyback on what Yahuru said, I, I, I think it, it, speaking as a moral theologian, you know, we are what we repeatedly do together. You know, formation happens mostly in shared practices and rituals, which is an important reminder for all of us on, on university campuses where we often think like the solution to this is, is to, you know, to hire for DEI or to do a program or to bring in a speaker and we've checked the box. You know, that, that programmatic response is really woefully inadequate. We have to think about how do we integrate this into the life stream of the university so that people have practice with restorative justice and, and to see that it is about practicing it, that we, we, we don't just get it right on the first try. And this is hard, you know, given our social context, we're so much, it, you know, is accomplished on demand or we get what we want right away or we're just training ourselves for that instant gratification. This is long, hard work. And, you know, that this someone, a questioner previously asked about the synod, you know, uh, on synodality and Pope Francis has called for us to journey together and to listen and leave no one out, leave no one out and leave no one behind. I think it's a good invitation to just keep opening those those lines of communication to make room for dialogue to let people really practice restorative justice uh together you know wherever we are rather than thinking this is like an add-on but just something that we integrate that one of my favorite lines from from that speech by pedro rupe that's you know now almost 50 years old um arupe says the struggle for justice will never end our efforts will never be fully successful in this life this does not mean that such efforts are worthless god wants our partial successes it's a good reminder that even if we don't get it all right that we're still taking steps on this journey together trying to head in the direction of reconciliation thank you marcus
Were there any other comments before we leave? Thank you so, so much for y'all staying with us. Um, we definitely want to respect um, your time. This was an absolutely amazing conversation. I'm going to ask Jim, can we do round two? <laughs> so we just were able to scratch the surface. But um, I'm going to ask that you all uh, you know, continue to think about how this work can be um, rolled out in, on your campus, ways in which you can use these processes um, to make effect, effective systemic and structural change on your campus. And, and not, not only thinking about um, one of the things Yuhuru um, in, in the initiative on his campus um, and just some of the things that he said, really thinking about how we can be these anchors um, in the community and impact the communities around us um, through this work. Uh, um, and this is what it means to live, live our values, um, to live fully into it um, and act. Uh, so thank you so much for your time today. And um, I'm gonna hang out for a little bit, but everyone else I have, I respect for your time. If you have to sign off, um, we totally understand. And um, if you want to lift up some things in the chat, we'll, I'll, we'll definitely get back to you. <laughs>